going to read, please, from Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read from the verse 9. Tonight we're going to look at the subject of total depravity. Uh, certainly this passage sets out that <coughs> truth. Romans 3 verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever, what things soever the law saith, saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We have been looking at uh, some chapters from this book of uh, Joel Beakey's Living for God's Glory. And the first couple of messages have been an introduction to the doctrines of grace and Calvinism in general. And this evening uh, we're coming to the chapter dealing with total depravity. Now, Joel Beakey begins this chapter with a quotation from Reverend Geoffrey Thomas. who was a long-term minister in Alfred Place Baptist Church in Aberystwyth in the promised land of Wales and uh, Jeffrey Thomas said Dr. Lloyd-Jones, another Welshman was hesitant about preaching on Sunday such doctrines as the five points of Calvinism he was a Calvinistic Methodist and unashamed of that but his approach was to permeate all his sermons with these truths and so to Calvinize people by showing them the greatness of our sovereign Lord and his free redemption. However, when Lloyd-Jones took part in conferences and discussions, he used theological and Calvinistic terms, but rarely did so when he preached on Sundays. And so Jeffrey Thomas says, I appreciate that wise response and have tended to take the same approach myself. But also think times come when these truths which are so preachable need to be declared clearly and uh, I think um, this was probably about 35 years into Jeffrey Thomas's ministry in Aberystwyth he preached a sermon on the five points of Calvinism he had been in the same pulpit for a long time and he mentions that Spurgeon when the Metropolitan Tabernacle was opened uh, there was a preacher that came uh, sorry different preachers came but they were given each of these points uh, for the nights Monday through to Friday. And so while we wouldn't set aside a normal Sunday meeting perhaps to go through these points, uh, we do want to over the, the next few weeks as the Lord gives help. Uh, the Reformers did have a great emphasis upon grace. And since their emphasis was upon grace, they met resistance. They met resistance, first of all, of course, from Rome, and most especially 
the Counter-Reformation. But then they met resistance from Arminius and his followers, referred to as the Remonstrants. And the Remonstrants had five points, and the five points here on the screen, I don't want you to think that these are the five that I'm teaching. These were the five points of the Remonstrants. And so they taught conditional election. So they said election is conditioned upon something. And so they said election is conditioned upon, based upon God looking forward, seeing who, who would choose him, and he elected them on that basis, which of course is not election then at all. And then number two, universal atonement, where they said that Christ died for everyone equally, but only believers actually experience the efficacy of Christ's death. And in their view, the atoning work of Christ then made salvation possible, but it didn't actually guarantee it to any. And then number three, partial depravity. So they did believe that man was seriously depraved, but not totally. And so they emphasized that <coughs> Even man in his natural state, man in Adam, has free will and ability to choose salvation. And a man then has this ability to cooperate, as it were, in the gospel call. That is, man naturally has an ability to cooperate. Then, uh, for resistible grace, uh, they said that the Spirit's work can always be resisted by the sinner. And then fifthly, lapsing from grace, which is commonly referred to today as saved and lost or falling from grace. Now initially, this was a matter, <coughs> excuse me, initially this was a matter of discussion among Arminius and uh, the early Arminians whether a believer could lapse from grace or not. But by the time the Synod of Dort came about, the Arminians had rejected what we would refer to as the perseverance of the saints. And so that they did believe at the time of the Synod of Dort uh, in this doctrine, as is put here, lapsed from grace. And the great battle then between Calvinism and Arminianism, of course it wasn't between Calvin and Arminius, Calvin was long dead, but this great battle it came to its climax at the Synod of Dort. <coughs> Excuse me. The Calvinists recognised that the Arminian teaching really threatened two particular vital gospel themes. First of all, that glory belongs to God alone in saving sinners. So the Arminian scheme gives glory to man. It emphasizes man's ability, man's desires, man's wishes that somehow sinners do actually have a desire to come to God, according to the Arminian group. And the Calvinist said, no, the glory of God uh, uh, the, sorry, the glory that, that then relation to salvation, it belongs to God alone. And then secondly, the security and assurance for the believer rests upon God's grace. So, not denying that we have a duty to believe and to persevere, but our peace, our assurance, and our security are all bound up in grace. And so the rejection of these two themes implies then the repudiation of salvation by sovereign grace alone. Now, of course we understand that the Arminian will say that they believe in a grace alone and yet their belief is certainly a marred by these two matters that are here on the screen before us, that their belief is attacking the glory of God, to glory of God alone, 
and that the believer's security is all bound up in God's grace. Now when it came to this synod dealing with these five points that we have mentioned, the delegates, that is the Calvinistic delegates, they refuted Arminianism both from a, a negative and a positive way. So negatively they refuted it, but then positively they sought to set forth the, the counter teaching as it were in a positive way. And uh, Bickey in his book then he uh, puts forth these points as the answer as it were to the Arminian position. The sovereign grace conceived. That is, where did the idea of sovereign grace come from? And we have there the idea of an unconditional election. Sovereign grace merited particular redemption, the death of Christ. Sovereign grace needed total depravity. Sovereign grace applied irresistible grace. And sovereign grace preserved the perseverance of the saints. And over coming weeks we'll go through these different points. Now these five points are intricately linked. They stand or fall together. Now, of course there are uh, some believers who will accept three or four of these points. And usually the one that they have a particular problem with is the issue of a particular redemption. And we'll uh, look at that subject when we come to it. Um, not just that uh, it's logical, but that it is certainly uh, a biblical doctrine. And uh, I did mention this before, but it's important to remember that these five points do not summarize all of Calvinism. And so when we look at these points down the right hand side here, and while they are referred to as the five points of Calvinism, they are not the summary of all that is Calvinism. That's why the Confession teaches more than these particular five points. But they do summarize what we might refer to as Calvinistic soteriology. A soteriology meaning the study of salvation. And so in relation to the matter of salvation, they certainly are a good summary. After this synod, the uh, particular points here were reorganized as far as an order was concerned. And that resulted in the uh, acronym TULIP. And so point one then under that system is total depravity. And so we're going to start with looking at uh, depravity then this evening. Uh, the Bible it teaches us that although fallen man is capable of doing some externally good acts, he can never do anything truly good or pleasing in the sight of the Lord uh, unless he is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And so under this teaching of a total depravity, we are emphasizing that the sinner is hell deserving. And in the chapter that Joel Beakey has on this, he has these five points that I've put here on the screen. And so in the time that's left, we're going to go through these and I'll seek to explain what he means by these five titles. And so these five titles really give us something of a summary of what the reform position on a total depravity actually is. So... When we say we believe in total depravity, sometimes that view can be misrepresented. And so hopefully in the course of the time that's left, uh, we can correct some of those misrepresentations. First of all, uh, total depravity refers to a deviant iniquity. And so we cannot separate the idea of depravity from iniquity, sin. And so total depravity refers to sinfulness and sin. 1 John 3 verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. Uh, and therefore, the sin does have to do with our failure 
to meet the demands of God's moral law. It does include then sins of omission. But it also includes sins of commission that we have broken the sorry, we, we've done things that the, the moral law has told us not to do. Sins of omission and sins of commission. In essence, sin is all that is in opposition to God. So how can we define sin? We'll come to some definitions of sin in a moment or two. But we could say that sin is anything that is opposition to God. It defies God. It defies his person, his character, his law, his covenant. Martin Luther said that sin fails to let God be God. Sin then seeks to dethrone God and put someone or something else upon that throne. And in the scriptures, both the Hebrew, Old Testament, the Greek, New Testament, there are different words used to give us an idea as to what sin actually is. And one of those key words is a word meaning miss the mark. And Romans 3.23, of course, is a great explanation of that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so God has set a standard for man, perfection. If man is to make his way to God, what is God demanding? Perfection. But we have sinned. We have missed the mark. And sin is also to be irreligious or irreverent. So if God is righteous and man is unrighteous, sin then is this idea that we are irreverent. We fail to grasp how holy God is and to treat the holy as holy. Sin is also transgression, transgressing the boundaries God's law, and so it's to violate his limits. God has set down the limits, but we transgress. We transgress the boundaries. And then it's to engage in iniquity, to deviate from a right course. The word iniquity, very often it's used in the authorised version, has the idea of lawlessness, and so sin certainly is lawlessness. It is also to disobey and rebel against God. And so there are these many ways in which the Bible speaks of sin. But certainly we all tonight as the Lord's people identify with those words of Isaiah. Isaiah 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. There's this deviant Iniquity. But then there is, secondly, this primary inwardness. And so total depravity. While the world, when they would hear that particular title, they would think of it primarily in terms of the outward. We as the Lord's people are to think of it primarily in terms of the inward, with an outward manifestation. And so the world, is, they would think about sin very often. They would think about murder, theft, cruelty, um, abuse. And so they would look at all of these outward manifestations. And of course those are sins. And yet God's word makes it clear that we are sinners and do sinful things because of sin arising out of our own heart. Uh, so if you could turn with me to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. These words are well known to us all. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15 verse 17. Do not ye yet understand... That whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out 
in the draught in the sewer. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. And so the Jewish leaders, they had got this all distorted in their minds. And they were so taken up with outward ceremonies that they had this idea that if we were to eat with unwashed hands, then will be defiled inward. And the Lord said, you've missed the whole point. That uncleanness comes from inside ourselves. And so, as Joel Beakey said, it's not so much that human actions or speech have missed the target. It is that the heart of man has missed the target. And so, our constitution, our very nature, is depraved. And so it's not just that we do depraved things, but the sinner is inwardly depraved. And so Adam's sin affected us in two chief ways. There was sin, his sin, sorry, his guilt and his sin imputed to us. So by his offence, um, judgment has come upon all men to condemnation, Romans 5, 18. But we also have inherited the pollution of sin. We are born sinners. We have a sin nature by birth. And so there's this state of guilt as well as our condition of pollution. And remember how we have those well-known words in Isaiah 64 that the very best that we can do, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Why is that? Because we cannot work up righteousness of ourselves out of a filthy source. The heart of man is bad. Uh, therefore, speaking about this inner depravity, and this is a vital part of what we refer to as original sin. Sometimes people talk about original sin as if that it just refers to the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, that that was the original sin, the first sin. Uh, original sin is referring to how, on account of that first sin, on account of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, we are born with this sin nature. We are born sinners. And so our actual sin proceeds from our original sin nature. John Bunyan, he saw his depravity surely when he talked about God's grace abounding to the chief of sinners. Like Paul, he saw himself there as the chief of sinners. And he saw that that depravity arose out of his own heart. Then thirdly, there is this tragic inclusiveness. That is, depravity affects every part of us. So depravity has affected our intellect. Uh, the greatest genius today is nothing in comparison to Adam before the fall. It has affected our conscience. We still have a conscience, but our conscience is not a perfect guide. It's fallen. Our emotions our ambitions, our wills, they are all affected, in fact, enslaved to and by sin. So, this depravity then is inclusive in this sense that it has affected every part of us. Now that does not mean that total depravity is absolute depravity. So it has affected every part of us but it doesn't mean that every single individual is as bad as he could be. Nor does it mean that the world 
is as bad as it could be. God has put his restraint so that though there is much evil, that there is a restraint upon evil. I've used the illustration before of if you were to have a glass of water and you pour poison into the water, every part of that water now has been contaminated, affected. Now it's not as strong, the poison is not as strong as it was in the original bottle that you've poured from. So it might be diluted in that glass, but the water in the glass is poisoned. And so we might not be as bad as it were as that bottle of poison, but we're like the glass of water. Every part of our being is affected by the poison of sin. And so, so total depravity then does not mean that an unbeliever is wholly evil in everything that he does, but it you know, does mean that nothing he ever does will be wholly good. And so we're not denying that the sinner can do charitable deeds, he can be a good citizen, he can show affection at home, he could be a hero, he could be a man of, or a woman of great courage, there could be great acts of self-denial, and yet even those acts of good are tempted by sin. Now, there's pride that, that lies behind their performance, perhaps some other secondary motivation. And so he has done something that is good, and yet it is far from perfectly good. So when we think about total depravity then, God is scrutinizing the human heart. Every part of us is under his scrutiny. And every part of us has been affected. Then number four, slavish inability. And depravity does bring inability. And Joel Beakey uses the term that the sinner is a sinaholic, a sinaholic. In Romans 6 verse 16, it talks there of the sinner being a slave to sin. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. And the word servants here could refer to slaves. And we think about a slave in the time of the New Testament, their time was not their own. They were not their own property. They belonged to their master. They had no wealth of their own. So their whole existence really was the master's. And Paul says, this is an illustration of how it is for the sinner. In his natural state, he is a servant, a slave to his sin. And isn't this what the devil blinds a sinner to today? That the sinner thinks he is free. The sinner thinks that he is determining his own destiny. And yet the truth is that sin is in charge. And therefore there is this inability. The sinner is so blinded that he has no ability to come. And of course there are many words in scripture that illustrate this to be the case. And one of them is the word dead. Ephesians chapter 2, the sinner is dead in trespasses and sins. And we can go and shout at the dead in the graveyard. But there will be no response. So it is. We speak to the sinner who is dead in the sin and we must. But unless the Lord takes that word, unless the Lord opens the heart, there will never be a change. And there never can be a change. Because the sinner is unable. The sinner has no ability to get himself out of that grip of sin. And then number five, deadly issue. Deadly issue. 
And here, uh, Joel Beek is referring to the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. That the consequence of sin, the consequence of this depravity is death, spiritual death, that the human soul is separated from a holy God, physical death, the consequence of sin, and then eternal death, where there'll be the rending of soul and body from God forever. Hell then is what total depravity ultimately brings. Scripture, and therefore Calvinism, teaches the sinfulness of sin, the awfulness of depravity. And as we see this first point then of Calvinism, it's emphasized to us the awful need that the sinner is in. We see his inability. And therefore we are exhorted to cry out to the Lord because we understand that if the Lord does not touch his heart, there never will be a change. If the Lord does not give him a new heart, there will never be a change. Ian Hamilton said, Calvinism challenges the residual pride in human hearts. You see, the reason why we maybe naturally would have a preference to Arminianism is because of this pride in us that, that we want to be able to say that we contributed, that, that we are saved because of what we have done. It's humbling to take the scriptural position and say salvation is all of grace. It's all of the Lord. It's a humbling thing to say that had the Lord never come and dealt with me, I would never be saved. My will was fallen. And yet as we think of that, we see then the greatness of grace. That tonight, though we continue to struggle against sin, yet what grace has brought salvation to us. We know that despite even our own sinful beings that we will be brought the whole way home to glory. And may the Lord bless our hearts as we meditate even on those truths.